my name is Greg Nidell. I'm a, I am the uh, Rev Robotics president, co-founder. Um, I am a first alumni. About um, 23 years ago, I was a student in a high school on a FRC team, just like you. Um, I've been doing this for a lot of years and I've held a lot of roles. I still mentor a team. I'm a lead robot inspector um, and we do a lot of stuff with Rev. Um, I went to RIT in Rochester, so I am very familiar with what it's like to be cold, even though I'm hanging out down here in Texas. Um, and um, I have a lot of patents to my name. I think innovation and protecting innovation is an important thing. And then I also um, captain team switchback on the TV show BattleBots, if you guys are familiar with that, that program. Um, I want to start by saying, you know, Rev is uh, one company, but we have really two brands or two different core product lines that we support first with. Um, we have Rev Ion and Rev Duo. Um, this presentation, because it's a, uh, this is a very FRC jumpstart, uh, we're going to focus more on the Rev Ion product line. Um, but I do want to kind of point out the Rev Duo system. Um, many of you who participate in FTC, um, or might have seen this in your classrooms because um, it's used in a lot of schools um, is two different scales. So when we build, we kind of have the Rev Ion stuff, which builds big robots, and we have the Rev Duo stuff that builds kind of smaller classroom ready stuff. But for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to mainly focus on Rev Ion product lines. Um, Rev Ion is something that we launched. Um, actually about a year and a half ago now. And the whole purpose of RevION was it's a series of parts that is both electrical and mechanical that just seamlessly work together. Um, and we're really trying to help teams make things work um, so that you can build the robot that you want to build uh, instead of being limited by, um, oh, I don't have the ability to fabricate this part or I'm worried that this electrical connection is not going to work well. We want to enable you to build the robot that you want to build and take your ideas and make them real. And so that's kind of the, the underlying premise of RevION is that it's um, it can serve a number of different purposes from teams who have no resources can build full robots out of it. Um, teams who have lots of manufacturing resources can use this as a prototyping platform. And what we've seen is that there's kind of some hybrid. There are some teams that build entire mechanisms and stuff out of it, and then they augment that with custom parts or kind of, but it, it all exists and it's trying to eliminate some of the frustrations um, that have previously existed in this. Um, this will be our third, 2024 will be our third year of the new rev control system components. So um, I think that, um, so when you put your robot together, um, there are a bunch of mandatory products that um, you have to use um, on your robot and Rev makes many of them. And so you have the main core robot controller uh, for FRC is the National Instruments Robo Rio, but around that, that controller you have, um, you need to do power distribution, you need to do motor control, you need to do uh, power your radio, um, if you use pneumatics, you power pneumatics, and Rev makes many of those products. Um, these are relatively new. They came out, like I said, this is the third season of them. Um, I presume that many of you have seen these devices, uh, but I'm going to kind of go through them in case there are some rookies or some folks who haven't uh, gotten to uh, play with them yet. So the uh, the main kind of core device that we that we make is called the Power Distribution Hub. It is, a, it is where all of the current on your robot gets distributed. So your main battery goes to the breaker and then it goes into this device and then every other thing on your robot gets power through this device. So this device has 20 channels of high current, so up to 40 amps, and then it's got some low current channels. So the nice part about this, and this is the improvement over the previous ones that first had is that now any slot on this device, you can put basically any motor that you want to pull the maximum current. 
um, which is a nice um, opportunity. So all your motors and things would be attached to the, the top levers um, in the orientation of this photo. And then you, where your main um, feed from your main breaker, or your battery would go in at the two bigger ones at the bottom. Uh, you'll also notice that there is um, those yellow and green connectors. Those are for CAN communication. Uh, and there's also a USB-C connector on this. So this device is actually a smart device. So you're able to get in real time the voltage of your whole system, the current on every individual channel. Um, one of these channels is switchable. So you can act as like it's got an integrated almost like a relay. Um, but it's really designed to give you some smart feedback. So you're like, wait a second, my battery voltage goes too low, maybe I'm gonna turn something off on my robot. So at the basic level, it just distributes power, but it also gives you the ability to um, make smarter robot control decisions uh, based on that sensor feedback. Um, we also make the individual resetting breakers. So every channel will need a breaker. Um, and that's how, these are really there to protect for, um, they are a current, to. Um, they are there and they do break at certain currents, but really these are there to try to protect your robot from fire and um, main short type of thing. So two main wires on a motor, a motor controller shorting out is, is going to pull current way high. Most motor controllers these days have smart current limits, so you should be doing your current limiting in software, and these are the kind of the backstop for those um, software current limits. Um, the pneumatic hub, um, if your team uses pneumatics, um, this is kind of an all-in-one device for pneumatics. So you would hook your compressor up to this, and this will take signals and turn your compressor on and off. Um, you have to plug in a pressure sensor, which is a um, either an analog sensor, which gives you the exact pressure of your system, or a digital sensor, which just gives you am I over, um, and it's gonna turn the compressor off at a certain um, PSI. You are only limited in FIRST Robotics according to last year's rules and presumably the year's rules coming up um, to 120 PSI at your storage. So this device will self-regulate um, your system and you don't really actually have to do anything in code to do that. You hook the compressor up, you hook the sensor up and it just does its thing. And then for actually actuating pneumatics, you would plug your solenoid valves into each one of the channels, and then you can switch on and off your pneumatics. Um, pneumatics are really great for a lot of reasons. Uh, if you haven't explored them for your robot, there's a lot of really great resources out there on, um, on pneumatics in general. Some of the reasons you might consider pneumatics is that they're very, um, they're, binary in the sense that they are either on or off. And that makes it really easy to like, if you wanna deploy an intake, for example, a pneumatic is a great way to do that because it can be out or in. Whereas if you use a motor, you might, you have to build a motor, build a gearbox, and then that gives you a little bit more variability. So there is a, a balancing act with pneumatics that says pneumatics are very quick and fast, but you only get it's all the way out or it's all the way in, whereas motors give you that full range of motion. Um, also with pneumatics, you have to deal with, um, you have to have the compressor on board. Um, and so their physical volume of the stuff you need is quite bigger. But if you're gonna run pneumatics, this is it. It's a device that also talks on CAN or USB um, as well. Um, this next one is one that um, I hope I see on everybody's robots. Um, this is how you power your radio. Um, the radio that you use for the Wi-Fi on your robot does not have an internal regulator in it. So if it's just hooked to 12 volts and your battery drops down in voltage, your radio will reset. That's not great. So um, this device, what it does is it, it boosts the voltage coming from the main battery, and then it gives the radio a constant voltage supply. So with this device, your radio, even if your battery drops down low at the end of the match, your radio will stay powered. Um, this device um, is really easy to uh, use. There's no programming, there's no configuration, there's no CAN, there's no communication. You literally just 
feed it two wires from the main power distribution, and then you connect your ethernet cables between your Robo Rio to this, and then this to your radio. And it uses um, power over ethernet to inject that power into your radio. So it's pretty much as bulletproof as you can possibly get. Um, some people might be familiar with the, um, the uh, voltage regulator module, which is the way we used to do this. Um, my only warning is you don't want to stack a voltage regulator and um, the radio power module. You just want the radio power module going right to the power distribution hub. Um, we saw some teams wiring it that way last year, and it, two regulators in a row can create some issues. Uh, but this is incredibly simple and designed to keep your uh, radio up and running. Um, Spark Max, um, the Spark Max motor controller has been our um, kind of flagship main motor controller. It's been in the kit of parts now going on five years or so. Um, it drives both brushed or brushless motors, um, works over CAN or PWM. Uh, you can configure it through the Rev hardware client or over um, parameters in your code. Um, it's got integrated closed loop control. And it pretty much, this will drive any motor that is FRC legal that does not have an integrated motor controller to it. So um, it will drive any motor basically except for the Falcon or the Kraken that have their own integrated motor controllers to it. And um, so this is, you probably have some of these in your shop or on your robot. Um, Neo brushless motors. So Rev has an entire line of motor uh, products. Um, we call them Neos. That Neo is the family uh, of the motor controllers. And we now have three. Um, so new for this year, we just launched the Neo Vortex. Um, I have a whole slide about the Neo Vortex uh, itself, but um, you may be familiar with the Neo and the Neo 550. And so effectively, um, both the Neo Vortex and the Neo are both your high power motors. You can use them on drivetrain, your shooters, your lifters, your elevators, your type of things. Your Neo 550 is an incredibly powerful motor, but it's really where it shines is in small places like your intakes, conveyors, um, and high speed mechanisms. That's where it really shines. And it really, from a packaging perspective, it's really nice because of how, how small it is. All right, so new for this year, um, we launched the Spark Flex and the Neo Vortex. So this is kind of the really big, um, big product for us this year. Um, we took all the feedback over the last five years of um, the, the Neo and the Spark Max, and we redesigned this platform. So the main differences with this is that this is a dockable motor and motor controller package. So the motor controller separates from the motor. Um, so they are still two pieces, but you can put them together directly, which means the encoder cables between the brushless motors and the motor controller are physical connections. They're no longer wires that might get snipped. Um, and so you would just feed this motor controller, the Spark Flex, just 12 volt power, and then everything is all in one power. This is pretty similar to the experience that you get, you know, with a um, with a Falcon, but the difference being is that because these are separatable, um, if you happen to burn out your motor or a motor controller or you need to change something around, you can independently replace the two devices. Um, that also means that the motor controller uh, is useful for other things beyond just uh, just this motor. Um, the other really interesting things uh, and highlight features to talk about on this is that this is a through bore motor. So it's kind of the first of its kind. It has a half inch hex through bore, so it has no shaft in the motor itself. So what that means is literally you can put this motor on any hex shaft in your entire robot, but we also make specialized shafts for different applications. So we have a gear shaft. So instead of taking a gear and putting that on a pinion or, or take a pinion, put it on a shaft with a keyway and work down that way, you just directly have gear that is on your shaft directly. Um, there is a direct coupler for the max planetary gearbox so that you don't have to deal with the coupler and the keyway and all that stuff. It just 
goes directly together. And then there's some other shafts that will also replicate. Um, there's both the Falcon shaft, input shaft, but also there'll be the Kraken shaft. Um, so as ecosystemly, if you want to eliminate all the keys, keys out of your system, you can do that with this. But also uh, it works with any size hex shaft. So this can directly be driven by a half inch hex shaft of any length, which is kind of a neat new thing. But I think that teams are, will uh, find some really interesting places to put this on their robot. And we really think this one, um, this motor and motor platform will serve teams very well for the next years to come. Uh, I do think it's important to note, um, we are not getting rid of the, the Neo, Neo 550 or Spark Max. These are additional to that. And so you will still get support for Spark Max and Neo um, for years to come. This is just an additional platform that we're adding for this season. Um, so talking specifically about the actual Spark Flex part of this um, motor controller, um, this motor controller is designed that it can work both with the motor, uh, with the Vortex, or standalone. So there'll be a dock that comes out that allows you to use this totally independently, and it features um, all the things that are inside of Spark Max, but it also adds a whole bunch of new capabilities. Um, some big ones that we know people will be happy with. Uh, it now has reverse polarity protection, so you won't burn a motor controller because of a simple wiring mistake. Uh, the data port has been totally overhauled. It's got a brand new locking connector on it. And we also have some really, some new um, interface stuff that's coming out. I'm not ready to, to spill all the beans on that yet, but you'll be able to talk to this motor controller through the data port um, using additional protocols and things that uh, are, have never been possible before. Um, we also have some new control modes that are gonna be coming out. Um, and this will work with the Neo or any of the backwards things. So the nice part about this ecosystem is that if you think about it from a um, four quadrant perspective, we have um, the Spark Max and the Neo that have gone together for a long time. We have an adapter that allows you to drive the new uh, Vortex motor from a Spark Max. So you don't need to buy new motor controllers to get the new through bore motor. And then we have the new motor controller that has a bunch of features and then also there'll be an adapter that allows you to run this independently. So then you can drive your old Neos, your Sims, your 775s or anything else off the new motor controller. So whichever kind of direction that your team wants to go, all this stuff is designed to work. So that's um, one of the big um, things that we try to uh, work on when we're designing new products is to make sure that things are backwards compatible so that you don't have to oh, there's a new product. Well, all the old stuff is now junk, right? We want to make sure that there's a cohesive ecosystem that you can uh, adopt over time or kind of make sure things, uh, you get the best value um, for the money that your team fundraises. Um, and so these are available now um, to pre-order and they will ship by kickoff. Um, they're in route to us now. So these are coming hot off the presses. Um, Rev Hardware Client. Um, the Rev Hardware Client is our core piece of software. Uh, the easiest way to describe it is, is that it, it is kind of the do everything talk to Rev products. Um, if it has CAN or USB on it, uh, if you plug it into a computer or connect to it uh, on a computer, you will be able to configure, modify, change the parameters, anything you want to do, firmware update um, within the Hardware Client. It is a one place whether you are an FTC team and it's a control hub or a driver hub, or you're an FRC team and it's a Spark Max or a power distribution hub or anything, um, the Rev Hardware Client is an all-in-one um, place to do that. Um, one of the things I do like to highlight on the Hardware Client, because not a lot of teams have maybe seen this, is we have this tab up at the top called telemetry. And what telemetry is all about is it's all about real-time data feedback um, maybe before your robot is even set up. So if you take one of our motor and motor controllers and plug it into the computer and give it power and you can real-time drive that motor, but you can also just spin that motor, see the current, see its RPM. You can mess with PID, 
parameters. Uh, you can see a lot of stuff. So think about it in this context. You're building a prototype intake on your robot. Maybe you have that on hex shafts. So now you could take the, um, the, Spark, uh, the Spark Flex and Neo Vortex, which has a hex shaft, you could drop that right onto that prototype, run this over the hardware client, and then get your speed, how much current it draws, and everything so that you can make smarter decisions. Um, this is a much better way to prototype because if you just use a drill to drive an intake, you don't actually know like what's the power of that drill compared to the motor that I'm going to actually want to use on my final robot. This way you get some actual practical data, but you don't need to set up the whole control system to make it work. Um, obviously you still need to be safe. You know, I recommend putting breakers and things in line and not just like plugging these right directly into a battery, but this telemetry can give you a lot of information on the current in your system, uh, if you have encoders or you've got positional that's running back through your motor controls, anything that, that is available to you inside of code, and I, we've got a pretty extensive documentation on this, can basically be displayed in real time on this graph. And then you can save that data um, as a CSV file and analyze it. So if you wanted to prototype a shooter, you can mess with your PID, see how fast it takes for your spinner flywheel to recover and then take that data back and say, oh, I want to mess with the gear ratio, or I'm going to change the current limit. And by upping the current limit, it recovers faster. There's a lot of really core engineering development tools that you can get, and it's just integrated into our regular software. So that's something that you should play around with, um, especially during the prototype part of the, uh, the season. Uh, going into the mechanical side, um, just like we've done on the electrical side where we're trying to make it so that just everything kind of intuitively goes together, we've done that on the um, mechanical side as well. Um, it all kind of starts with our max tube, uh, and we do have several new sizes of this that we'll be announcing this year, but the max tube is patterned aluminum. It's pre-drilled, um, and everything is on a half-inch grid. So everything just kind of bolts together and works. Um, the biggest feature here is that if you notice that um, that hole in the middle, those are all on two inch spacings. So we call that that hole, which you would see on our wheels and some of our gears and the tubing, this is max line. So the inside six um, pedals will support a standard 1.125 bearing, but also the outside is really great for torque transfer. So we have a shaft that goes through that that allows you to do giant torque transfer through those holes, but also any of these can support a standard bearing hole. Um, this hole, this, uh, the geometry on this uh, hole is designed that it can be 3D printed or CNC'd or any type of machining. So if you want to make a custom intake or your team that wants to 3D print something that interfaces, you can grab the CAD and just, it will directly work. That's a lot harder in like a half inch hex, for example, to transfer that geometry to custom parts. Um, but where this really starts to shine is in uh, things that are on pitch. So for example, on the, um, with 20 DP gears, which is what most of our rev ion gears, if you have two gears that have a center to center, uh, that have a, a total number of 80 teeth, so you add up the teeth and the total count is 80, that means that the center to center distance of those gears is um, two inches, which works perfectly on this tubing. So I wanna create a little gear ratio. I can say, oh, look, 20 to 60, right? That's a three to one gear ratio that's on an exact center to center distance. But wait a second, I wanna quick change. That's not the right ratio. Well, now let me grab two 40 to 40 gears. And it's as simple as sliding the gears off, putting the different gears on, and you can change the ratio without remachining a plate or doing kind of any other thing. Because this is a even pitch system, that also means that 25 sprockets and chain are also even pitch. So any one-to-one -one sprocket and chain works there. And then we also have a belt standard that's called RT25 that gives you a bunch of belt and pulley options that are all gonna work on this pitch too. So the, the idea here is just, rapid iteration that that's that's kind of the fundamental part of rev ion is 
if you ask any of the top teams, what they will tell you is the, the secret to their success is the, is the speed that they go. And whether that is their ability to custom manufacture parts really quickly or just roll through prototypings, the faster that you create and validate your designs, the quicker you're gonna find the mistakes in your design so that you can fix that for the next one. If, you, if it takes you two weeks to design an intake for your robot during the six week build series, you might only get three intakes. Whereas if you can design an intake in one week, now you can get six of them. If you can design an intake in a day, now you can have 42 of them, right? So it's, it's all about speed because you don't wanna show up at the competition with version one of your intake, because I promise you version one will not be the best version your robot can build, but you need to go faster in order to have a one, a two, a three. Um, and so that's kind of what we're trying to provide is a platform that people can iterate very quickly even if these parts are not the final parts in your robot, it can use as a prototyping platform. Um, and then ION has lots and lots of parts. So everything, wheels, gears, brackets, gussets, tube, sprockets, standoffs, hardware, um, it's designed to be very interchangeable and the parts are designed to be reusable. So everything uses a 1032 screw, everything that means that basically you can put together and take apart your whole robot with uh, a 532nd or an eighth inch Allen wrench and a, a 3 8 wrench. Um, and it all just kind of designed to fit together and to work. So all of our wheels have the max spline. That means that all of our wheels can either be a dead axle where they've got bearings in the wheel, or you can put a hub in it and convert it to hex or you can drive it with a max spline tube if you've got high torque. So it's all just designed to kind of work together as a cohesive system of parts. Um, we intentionally do not have every option of gear and every option of, you know, like every possible combination because we're trying to say, these are the most common ones and to kind of enable you to go faster without having to worry about, well, I have a 64 tooth gear and a, Thing, we want to provide you the options that are going to work on pitch and work kind of in the scale of the system. But we are constantly adding new products to this. Um, a couple core features of uh, core products that are in this that we think enable you to go fast. Um, we have a Max Planetary Gearbox. This has been out for several seasons. Um, it's overbuilt for FRC. Let's just be honest. It's, it is way stronger than it needs to be for the motors that are being plugged into it. But the idea is just, it goes together, it works. You're probably not gonna break it. Um, and they, the individual stages of this are um, pre-assembled and pre-lubricated. So you just can swap out cartridges however you want. We have a three, a four and a five to one gear ratio. So you can multiply those as you go. Uh, and then also, I'm not going to tell you which one yet, but there is another gear ratio coming out for this season. Um, and then um, we have compatibility with the Vortex through a direct uh, shaft, but we will also have a Kraken spline input kit that's going to be coming out in January for people who have elected to go with the new Kraken motors. So you will have ability to put all this together, regardless of which motor um, you choose. Um, Three inch max swerve. Um, we launched this last year. Uh, for the most part, it went well. Uh, we had some wheel wheel issues uh, last year. Uh, some of you probably saw some teams scrambling about their wheels. Um, the modules were never the issue, it was just the wheels. Um, so we've redesigned the entire wheel and we have a 2.0 wheel, which is really designed now and it will last an entire event. Um, we also still have metal wheel options uh, if you want to run tread instead of running the rubber wheels. But uh, these are the lowest cost swerve option that you can get on the FRC market. So if your team is thinking swerve, and I think probably honestly every team is thinking swerve a little bit, um, this is a pretty good option. I know that there are teams in your area that have used it. Um, you can reach out to them and get a more, uh, I'm biased, I think they're great, but I also you know, get your own, get your own feedback. Um, and these are available now too. So we have these in stock. We have plenty of them 
um, either in stock or, or in route to us. So that the idea that you can just buy them whenever you need them, there's no waiting time on these. It's just a regular product for us now. Um, so ultimately the, the build system is all about making iteration fast. Um, when we designed it, uh, we designed a whole bunch of robots and to try, so how would we replicate that? How would we do this? And uh, that's what Rev Ion is really all about. Um, I do want to point out a couple other things. Um, since last year, we've also launched this, um, this on-shape application examples library. So we have designed a whole bunch of little just mechanisms out of Rev Ion. And they're all on our website. There's a link here. Um, but if you just go to docs.revrobotics.com, you'll be able to, to see those. But um, you can see them as a picture, but you can also just open them in Onshape. So even if you're not an Onshape CAD user, or even if your team is not a um, CAD team, you can click them in your browser window without logging in, spin them, measure them, see how stuff is assembled. And um, in the case of like a swerve drivetrain, if you want, you can literally just grab that CAD file and just drag it in as a base of your robot, make a copy, change everything. We release a lot of files in Onshape because we find that um, being able to see it, turn it, spin it, really gives people an idea of how to build with this stuff. Um, and you can pretty much build anything that you can put your mind to. And so this application examples are designed to show you how to do things that you may not be able, you may not know um, on your own. And we're constantly coming up with new ones um, and we're gonna keep expanding this library of um, available CAD. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about is the Rev Starter Bot. Uh, we did this, we've done this for FTC for the past three years and we did our first one for FRC last year. Um, basically, we design a robot um, that plays about 65 to 75% of the game and it is all built out of Rev Ion. Um, yes, it can seem like this is a sales thing for Rev Ion, but the other idea here is that this is a robot that you can build to get started if you don't know where to start. And the nice part about what our every our program is as compared to like every bot is there's really no um, cutting custom machining or anything in this robot. So if you're like, hey, I built this robot and you get into it and you're like, oh, I want to design a new intake, you take those parts apart, you can reconfigure them and maybe you have to buy a little bit of extra tubing or some extra hex shaft, but you're not going to like custom machine every part of this, which is one of the, I really do love the EveryBot program, but one of the pieces of feedback we've gotten on it is that it's like, you have to custom machine all these parts. And then if you want to evolve as a season, you kind of have to start over. The starter bot is designed to be a starter foundation. So um, we will be releasing the 2024 starter bot within the first week of build season. Our goal is actually to release it on Monday of, of the first week of build season. Um, we do not expect this robot to win the world championship. Do not build this robot thinking it will win the world championship. But we think that this will give you a scaffolding of a place to start or at least to share what we think about or maybe how to use some of the parts for a robot that you want to build. And that'll be located at that link. Um, and we also will release the code and the CAD and every part of it. Um, we are not trying to steal your team's aha, but we do recognize that there are a lot of teams out there that just don't know where to begin. Um, First is releasing a robot this year at kickoff, which is designed around the kit chassis, um, which will be, I don't, I've never seen it. I don't know what it is, but it's designed to be built with stuff in the kit and stuff from like Home Depot or local suppliers. And so between that program, the EveryBot program that 118 does and the starter bot, um, hopefully we'll give you some ideas if you want them. If not, create your own ideas and your own thing. We just put it out there as a resource. Um, I put team sponsorship out here. Um, I want everybody to know um, about a couple things. So first of all, um, every single year, at least for the last few years, uh, Rev has donated 50 bucks to every single team. So that is a pure donation. Your team has $50 of Rev credit that you can spend in your first dashboard now. Um, 
please go spend it. Uh, every year I'm surprised that we get a lot of teams that don't use those funds. Um, you can go and buy things on Rev's website that are less than $50, right? So you can go get shaft collars or shafts or, or individual parts with, that cost you nothing but the shipping to get it to you. And that is free for everyone. Um, we also have um, a, a sponsorship program called Team Rev. Uh, I know you have some Team Rev teams in your area, um, but we give out a um, $100,000, uh, a little actually more than that this year, um, and sponsor a bunch of teams. Um, we look for teams that want to be successful in all elements of being a team, whether it's supporting, um, you know, they, they are a good performer on the field. They do a lot of the community stuff that would be good for the, um, the impact award, but also they're just good teams that want to support their communities. So um, look for those rev teams to maybe if you need local support, you can obviously always reach out to us, but there are probably teams in your region that could help you with this stuff. Um, the program is closed for this year already. We've already selected our teams, but we do open this up every summer in July. And we do not have, our program is set up that there will be teams that carry on year to year, but we will have new teams every single year. So it's more of a sponsorship program than like a, oh, once, well, that team, you know, I, every team has a shot to do this. We get an incredible number of applicants, but we encourage you to apply because we want this to go to teams that need it. Um, um, another one that I want to plug um, before I get to questions is um, the Open Alliance. Um, how many people know about the Open Alliance? Ah, okay. So the Open Alliance is not directly Rev related. Um, but the Open Alliance is a group of teams that have come together that basically say, we are gonna just open up our build season. So they generally have threads on Chief Delphi or on their websites, there's a discord, but they are like totally open about their prototyping, their CAD, their everything about them. So you can go and follow along and get ideas. I, I think that everybody in this room or every team probably played with a part, a robot that had a part on it that came from an open alliance team, whether you knew it or not. So um, last year, for example, um, team 111 Wild Stang came up with this really cool intake. They posted on their open alliance, all the CAD, all the details on it. And then a lot of teams around first took that and then made it their own. So the open alliance is a, is a fantastic resource. Um, it also happens that a lot of open alliance teams also happen to be team rev teams. Um, there's a, there is a crossover there. And then um, I host a weekly uh, show on fun that is uh, where we talk to Open Alliance teams and ask them questions about how they discovered things, what their process. So if you've got limited prototyping capabilities or you just want to see what other teams are doing and how they're thinking, tuning into the Open Alliance as part of the build season is a pretty valuable resource. Um, Oh yeah, and I always leave this group with a new pro couple new product teasers of stuff that's coming out. Um, we have these cool new little um, flappers that are coming out to add to our compliant wheel line. Um, and uh, these come in all the different durometers and they're just kind of flappy. So if you have irregular shaped game objects or things like that, that's what they're really designed for. We will have these in both half inch hex and also five millimeter hex for the duo um, FTC teams. And then the sprocket on the other side of the screen is these are billet sprockets that we're coming out with. So we've done plate sprockets before, but what happens is under high loads, a lot of times those plate sprockets will want to bend. So for arms or for heavy load things, these are machined out of billets. So they have a lot of thickness. So these are a lot stronger um, and can be used in a lot of different places on your robot. So both of these will be available um, on our website soon, but for this season, for sure. And um, that's, that's the presentation. Um, I think we still have time for uh, questions. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen here so you can uh, see my pretty face. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have.
Um, we don't have pricing for the dock yet. So, so there's, so if you want to use the spark flex with the normal Neo, um, there'll be an adapter. Um, we don't have final pricing on it to be very transparent. That product is, is the slowest of all the, of all the things that we're working on for spark flex and vortex, but it is not going to be expensive. It's in the, like, call it 20 to $30 range is what it's going to end up being. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, uh, so we, we updated and released, um, we updated our 2023 RevLib to 24 so that it was, it's compatible. Um, we have a whole bunch of new um, software libraries and things as part of RevLib. Um, and a lot of it actually has to do with um, some of the new features inside of the Spark Flex and the Vortex. Um, we are targeting a release of that um, this month. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's all kind of a thing because we're trying to get the motor controllers and everything all together all at once, but I would look for a full release of that in all the libraries. Um, you know, the latest would be kickoff, but, um, the most it does, it's not changing significantly. We are adding uh, a lot of features to support the new motor controllers. So we're, we're trying to do non-breaking changes on, um, all the new stuff. Yeah, so Rev, Rev will be um, putting in a uh, proposal for the control system. Um, that's something that we've been working on. Um, I can't really talk more about it just right this second, but um, we it is something that we are we are going to be putting a proposal in. Any other questions? Um, they are different. Um, they, the V, we, we, <laughs> the process of testing to get to the V2 wheels was, uh, pretty, uh, intense, um, because we knew we couldn't mess this up, but, uh, no, we, uh, we've run these wheels at several off season events. Um, I think that you had some 1.1s, I think were the ones that you tested, um, last season. Um, the 2.0s are significantly better. Uh, we actually changed the material, the core material, to get better mechanical adhesion between the plastic core and the rubber, um, chem sorry, chemical adhesion. And then uh, we also modified the geometry of the wheel to get better mechanical adhesion. So, um, so there's, there's some material differences and there's some changes to the actual wheels. They still work on the, on the modules. There, there's no, it's, but the rubber will basically, it is effectively impossible to roll the rubber off the wheel now. And so the, the wearing is just wearing the wheel. Um, so you'll be able to run them significantly longer um, because the majority of teams failures was rolling the rubber off the side and there was still plenty of um, material there. And ultimately we learned from our own kind of failure is that when you take a side hit on a robot, that energy was just too much for the, uh, the the bond that we had. So that was something we did, and we did a lot of uh, fun impact testing to uh, determine if these wheels were good enough. But uh, we had uh, some of our local teams running them in off seasons, and uh, we feel really good about uh, the 2.0 wheels. Um, 2.0 wheels are shipping right now, so every swerve module you would get now has a 2.0 wheel. And if they're not on our website for sale already, they will be very soon. Um, but, um, they're, they're very good. And like my team will run them 3005 will run them. Like we, the rubber, we really love the rubber wheels as compared to the, the treaded wheels. And we think that we've finally gotten the compound and everything correct, that it'll get the performance that people want.
Sure. So, um, well, let me tell you a couple of things. So um, we did some crazy testing on Vortex um, to put it, I, I, I don't have a picture to share of this. I wouldn't actually worry too much about this. We did a, a test where we had a shaft coming out the backside of this motor with a huge mass on it. And we basically were trying to run the thing until it failed. Um, I would not worry too much about the cantilever um, loading on this. The front bear, the bearings are high quality. Um, you're probably gonna be okay. Um, I will say one of the things, and I, I guess I haven't really pointed this out to many people um, specifically, but if you know, look at the front of the, the actual um, motor, this is recessed sized for the flange of a regular 1.875 bearing. So if you are bolting this up to a piece of tube, it doesn't hurt to put another bearing here and then support the shaft. Obviously, we encourage you to support the shafts. If you're running this with a like, you know, giant piece of hex shaft like this, sure, put, put bearings at the end of this. Don't just leave this cantilevered, but it's not going to be any worse than like a normal motor. And in, in many cases, it's going to be better because the bearings are significantly bigger um, in the motor than like the, mo the bearings that are in like the Neo um, or the Falcon, for example. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. But yeah, if you're going to put a long shaft on this, tail support it with another bearing. Um, that's just good mechanical practice. Any other questions? All right. Well, uh, I, I appreciate you uh, giving me uh, time. I hope you learned something. And like I said, if you've got any questions, um, feel free to reach out to us on support. Um, we do have a bunch of new stuff that we are still announcing for the season. And uh, we're excited to uh, see what you guys build with it.